Hello all, it's John again, the old geek, and today I'm taking you back in time to an age before the first edition AD&D Dungeon Master's Guide existed. This is my review of G1, the steading of the Hill Giant Chief. G1 was originally published in 1978, it was written by Gary Gygax and was the first official indi individual adventure module to be published by TSR for AD&D. It was closely followed by other modules in the series, initially G1-3 and D1-3. There would then be a wait of a couple of years before the finale to the series, Q1, would be available. The G series would later be combined into G1-2-3 Against the Giants in 1981, and released again as part of the GDQ-1-7 super module, Queen of the Spiders. Further versions would appear Converted for later editions of D&D in 1999, 2012 and 2017. In this review I'm going to be focusing on the original. Even though the only two copies I personally own are in the form of G123 and GDQ127. There they are. Okie dokie, presentation. As you might expect from such an early release, it is best described as rudimentary. The original release was a simple eight page booklet inside a cardboard outer cover containing the maps. The cover art for the earliest version of G1 was abysmal. And to be honest, I'm not a big fan of the covers of either of the two 1980s releases either. Being such a slim booklet, interior art was kept to a minimum, but some of the images are better than that on the cover. Text is brief, Lacking in stats for the monsters, you just get their hit points basically. A DM was expected to have the monster manual to hand quite clearly. The saving grace though comes in the form of the maps. They show that progress is not always a good thing, as this basic, bold, clear map format worked. Simple and uncluttered, exactly how maps should be. The words simple and uncluttered Describe the plot of this adventure too. Giants have been raiding. Find out why and put a stop to them. That's it. Now off you go. Have a jolly good time while you're doing it and get lots of loot and XP. This series of modules was used at Origins for the tournaments in 1978. The cover of my green one there says 1979, but I believe as the original modules came out in 78, it has to be the 78 tournament they were used for. I'm willing to be proved wrong though on that one. But unlike most other modules which started life in a similar way, none of them feel like tournament adventures. In Steading the Hill Giant Chief, you have a fairly authentic feeling giant stronghold made up of two levels. It's just about big and beefy enough to house hill giants. Well, the upper level is. There's a rather infamous issue with the lower level, which I'll come to in a minute. The steading has a feasting room, kitchens, servants' quarters, a council room, private rooms for the chieftains, his wives, offspring and visitors, and so on. There are two routes down to the lower level, and both can be reached without ever having to face the main mass of giants. This is an excellent piece of design as it allows the party to be crafty, and we like crafty. The lower level is a bit more of a traditional dungeon. It doesn't make as much sense, but it's fun to explore all the same. The issue down here is mostly one of scale. The area housing orc slaves and their bugbear jailers is far too small. Some of the cells are more like the Black Hole of Calcutta, or the black hole of Gygax. Most intriguing is the abandoned temple though, to an insane forgotten god. Examples of these temples would appear throughout the series and bear a striking resemblance to the subject of module WG4. I know that they were not officially linked, but they are too similar in my opinion for it all to have been a simple coincidence. I've often seen detractors of this series describe them all as simple hack and slash. If you want to fight, G1 will give you a fight. There are 29 giants, 8 ogres and a cave bear all in the main hall, very close to the entrance, 
There you go, big fight. And there's loads more giants scattered all around the lair, and plenty of stuff to kill in the lower level too. But, if your experience of running this adventure is merely hack and slash, then you did it wrong. Maybe you were a bad DM, or you were bad players, or even you had bad both. Here's how my group approached it recently. They found a nearby cave in which to hide, not in the adventure, I just made it up, and spent a while observing the steading. Their thief, equipped with items to make him quiet and unseen, because high level thieves will typically have those, he crept inside. He scaled the wall of the watchtower initially, and even though there's no windows shown, it's a watchtower. So logically, it would have a window so that watching can be done. Once inside, he dealt with the guard in there silently, as the guard is sleeping. There's a party going on in the main hall making lots and lots of noise, so this is unlikely to wake any of the other guards. And he, this one is drunk as well, as he is still holding his flagon of mead. The thief then proceeded to silently, and under co the cover of the noise from the, uh, the main hall, scout out the southern part of the steading. He drew a map and avoided the busier areas, areas before returning to the rest of the party. They then formulated a plan. They all went in, under cover of silence, again through the guard tower, killed some giantesses and young giants, and then planted blood-stained weapons and clothing on the remaining drunk, sleeping, male hill giant guards. And then they retreated and waited several days. I ruled, logically, that chaos would ensue. The emissaries from other giant tribes would leave as a result, and that some of the giants would be killed by the chief as revenge. So, what did they do next? They broke in through the back entrance, got lucky, and quickly found the route down to the lower level. Once there, they dealt with the keeper and the bugbears, and then freed and armed the rebellious orc slaves then sat and waited. Again. Hack and slash? No. This is a clever adventure which presents such opportunities to an ingenious party who have a DM who is willing to run with their schemes. Isn't that the epitome of a classic D&D &D mindset? Of course our game did end with a massive fight but crucially the players actions had managed to reduce enemy numbers significantly as I already said, this module is just eight pages long. Room descriptions are short, but neither of these are in any way issues, as the simplicity of the format and the intelligent design of the whole thing gives a sense of freedom. I estimate it took my group about 25 hours to complete it all, and they really got into it, creeping round, coming up with plans, discussing things. They, they, it seemed like they loved it. That's the impression they gave to me anyway. All of this in an eight page adventure. If only later adventures could be quite so efficient. Opinions on how difficult this adventure is seem to be quite mixed. Quite simply, it's tough if the party charge in headlong, but much simpler if they use their smarts. The balance and the reward for good play in G1 is something that really makes it stand out. The rest of the series would be physically much, much tougher though. As I mentioned earlier, there were later versions of this adventure, and most stayed true to the original. Sadly, the weakest version in my opinion was the most recent one, the one in the 5th edition tome Tales from the Yawning Portal. Giant numbers were reduced because, you know, balance. Can't expect players to have to use their brains now, can we? They have to feel all powerful and be able to win everything in a straight fight. 
The point of most older modules was specifically to test the players. Their ability to act within the environment of the adventure, not their ability to create a powerful character. For them to be able to go against seemingly impossible odds and turn everything in their favour by being creative. It's sad that this aspect seems to be forgotten. Neutering these adventures goes against their original purpose. Anyway, back to AD&D. So we have a thin adventure using fairly common and mostly quite mundane creatures. There are very few traps. The whole thing makes sense and is not especially fantastical. There's not much of a storyline, not much of a plot. And yet when I ran this poll I did, check out the rest of my channel to find out about it, this adventure came third overall out of 95 and was rated as, as being the best adventure in the entire GDQ series. Despite the others being bigger, with more interesting foes. And that's because G1 works. It is quite simply a lesson in how to write a flexible and meaty scenario with a minimum of waffle. For some that might seem odd given that Gygax was known for his wordiness. But this is normal for the adventures he wrote. He tended to get his verbal diarrhoea in his rule books. I give G1 Steading of the Hill Giant Chief a mighty 9 out of 10. There's a reason why it has been adapted and reissued so many times. It's one of AD&D's module masterpieces. Well, I hope you enjoyed this review again. Like, subscribe, see you again soon.